Okay, I think we might be back in business. Sorry about that, folks. Thank you for your patience. Um, wouldn't be alive with me without technical difficulties, that's for sure. Um, so again, going back to what we were talking about, it's National Speech Pathologist Day. We're talking about what a speech pathologist does. Um, and so I was talking about how if you were to do a quick Google search about uh, what speech pathologists is and what they do, um, that it's a very, very vague sort of description. Um, there is a website called whatsslp.com, and this provides a gem of a definition, of a concise defi definition of what a speech pathologist does, and it states that a speech pathologist helps people with difficulties from the neck up, which includes communicating, eating and swallowing, and thinking. And so as I was preparing for this, um, I got to realizing that um, I've been a speech pathologist myself for about 18 years now, but I didn't know how speech pathology came to be, where it started. So I did some digging and um, found some information from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill um, that describes speech pathology beginning in the 18th century England with what was called speech elocution or speech perfection. And in the U.S., this speech perfection or speech elocution expanded to include communication disorders following a book that was released by a medical doctor named Dr. Samuel Potter, who described in it several different speech and language disorders. And so although the field was broadening, the emphasis was still primarily on speech production, um, which led to the development of the American Academy of Speech Correction in 1926. Following World War II, soldiers were returning home with traumatic brain injuries from war, which led to massive increases in a condition called aphasia. And aphasia is a disorder resulting in difficulty communicating, comprehending language, reading and writing due to an injury to the language centers of the brain. So an individual may have trouble with word finding or may not be able to speak at all. And then in the 40s and 50s, there was an increasing interest in brain processing or what was referred to as mentalism at the time. In addition to studies of the brain, advances in technology and standardized testing. And this is when speech pathology became speech pathology. And today, um, speech pathology is categorized into a group of professions called related health or allied health professions. And allied health professions are distinct from nursing and medicine and pharmacy, but work in conjunction with those fields. And some examples of these allied health professions include audiology, optometry, occupational therapy, and physical therapy, just to name a few. So you'll find speech pathologists in schools, in hospitals, in inpatient and outpatient rehab clinics, home health, private practices, universities, and telenervention, which a lot of us uh, recently with COVID got lots of good experience in becoming telenerventionists in order to continue that continuity of care for our patients while we were home. If there are other settings that I failed to mention, if you're a speech path in the, um, in the group, please um, put it in the comments so I can acknowledge it. So what exactly does a speech pathologist do? Um, Emerson College gives us a nice list, um, although not an exhaustive one, of daily responsibilities. Um, a speech pathologist will conduct screenings to assess speech and swallowing concerns, and this is for babies through adults. Um, they will evaluate and diagnose speech, language, and communication disorders, develop appropriate treatment plans, provide rehabilitation and communication strategies for those who are deaf of hard of hearing, um, including those who are learning to listen and talk. Uh, they train, communicate with, and educate family and caregivers of those with communication or swallowing disorders. And some provide augmentative and alternative communication systems or um, things called AAC devices for people who experience challenges with severe expressive language disorders or language comprehension disorders. Um, and some examples here could be autism or um, ALS, which is a myotrophic lateral sclerosis. And these AAC devices help to supplement or replace speech or writing for individuals with severe impairments, allowing them to have a voice, allowing them to verbalize. So question for the audience, can you name a famous person who utilized an augmentative system to communicate? 
And since we're short on time, I'll probably go ahead and just share. Um, the one that comes to my mind is Stephen Hawking. Um, he was diagnosed with ALS at 21 years of age, and he used a speech generating device um, to communicate for years and years, and he was very successful using that. Um, if there are others that you can think of, also please put those in the comments for me. Um, we can look at speech pathology and view it in two major categories. We have medical and educational. And our medical speech pathologists make up approximately 14% of practicing SLPs, and our school-based speech pathologists make up approximately 40% of practicing SLPs. Um, so a hospital-based or medical-based SLP, the main responsibilities here include diagnosing and treating cognitive, language, communication, and swallowing disorders, working with patients who suffer from chronic diseases or been affected by trauma to the brain, such as stroke, seizure, cancer, or physical trauma, prescribing modified diet plans for clients experiencing um, swallowing or what we call, or swallowing um, problems, which we call dysphagia, and then implementation of methods for these communication and swallowing disorders. So another question here is, if you had to guess, which is more dangerous to a person, who has problems with swallowing. And your choices are a milkshake or orange juice. So if a person has a swallowing problem, which would you think would have um, a bigger impact? Which would be more dangerous, a milkshake or orange juice? And of the people I polled, 27% said milkshake and 73% said orange juice. And if you chose orange juice, you're correct, but it may not be the reason why you think. Um, some people thought that it had to do with the acidity or with the pulp in it. And actually, orange juice, um, along with water and soda and tea, are considered thin liquids. If we have a disordered swallowing mechanism um, or the timing is off with the swallow due to weakness or um, other impairments, uh, it can go down the wrong tube and can go directly into the lungs, which can cause aspiration pneumonia. So this really can be a life and death situation. So the thicker the liquid, the better here um, for a person with swallowing problems. So moving into school-based school -based speech pathology, um, these professionals work with school age children or college students with a range of learning physical and auditory disabilities or disorders that affect their educational performance. They consult with teachers, administrators, and families. They perform classroom-based services and facilitate small group and individual speech sessions. They work collaboratively to develop a treatment plan tailored to an individual student's communication and swallowing challenges. We're seeing a pattern here and developing an implementation of individualized education programs or IEPs, which is a document that defines goals and accommodations for a child with a disability. So, true or false, as part of a speech pathologist training, they acquire skills to interpret a child's speech when they are unintelligible. So meaning if this child, you can't understand a word they're saying edgewise, can a speech pathologist based on training uh, help interpret what the child is saying. Um, of the people I polled, 64% said this was true and 30% said this was false. And I wish this was true because it would make our lives a lot easier. Parents are typically the best able to translate what a child is able to say. The speech pathologist would identify errors and error patterns to help develop a plan of attack in order to um, help improve the child's intelligibility. So um, what does it take to become a speech pathologist? Well, it involves obtaining a master's degree, specialized training in anatomy and physiology, neuroscience, child development, language, and, and a lot more. Um, it involves rotations within pediatric and adult settings, which includes hands-on educational and medical experiences. And then upon completion of graduate school, um, an SLP is responsible for babies to adults, so birth to earth and everything in between. And specialization doesn't typically occur until entry into the workforce. So a speech path learns a little bit about a lot of different things. And as of now, um, areas of specialization or where you can uh, achieve board certification um, are in child language disorders, fluency disorders, which is stuttering, and swallowing disorders, which is dysphagia. And a unique specialization that an SLP can pursue, uh, which is near and dear to my heart, is certification in listening and spoken language. 
Um, this is typically a three-year process following the acquisition of a master's degree. Uh, you are mentored by a certified listening and spoken language specialist and you are required to pass another test for certification. Um, and what's interesting about this field is that audiologists and teachers of the deaf are also um, able to become a listening and spoken language specialist. So what's the difference, you may ask, between a speech language pathologist and an, a speech language pathologist who is also a listening and spoken language specialist, or a LISLS is how it's referred to. So in addition to having the foundation of a speech pathologist, a, a LISLS specializes in hearing loss and the impact it has on brain development and listening and spoken language outcomes. Alyssals collaborates very closely with audiologists daily. They understand auditory skill development and guides and coaches parents to facilitate listening and talking at home through, loose, for, through usage of listening and spoken language strategies. That's a tongue twister for sure. Um, Shifting gears just a little bit, this is just some, some information I found in interesting as I was putting this together. Um, speech and language disorders are no respecter of persons. There are some famous people who um, are battling speech and language um, issues currently, um, both Carly Simon and James Earl Jones. Carly Simon was a, a, or is a singer-songwriter from the 70s. And James Earl Jones, a famous actor who was the voice of Darth Vader, um, as well as Mufasa from The Lion King, both were severe stutterers as young children. Um, Carly Simon uh, developed hers when she was six, uh, was treated by a psychiatrist unsuccessfully, um, and her mother realized that when she would sing, she wouldn't stutter. And it would just, that was just a, an outlet for her, which is eventually what led her to become a singer and songwriter. And her mom had the wherewithal to figure out that if she tapped on her leg um, while talking, that she could get through those difficult um, communication moments when she was stuttering. Um, and so why would a person not stutter when they sing, um, but they would when they would talk? So the ability to talk or our language um, centers are in the left hemisphere of our brains and singing is a function of the right. So essentially she was accessing the, um, the left side of her brain through song um, and then used that over the years to, to become more fluent in her speech. Um, and James Earl Jones, uh, he stopped talking at around five because of his stutter um, and yeah, didn't say a word until he was about 14 when an English teacher discovered that he was a very gifted poet. So gifted, in fact, that um, he thought that the poetry had been plagiarized and so had him get up in front of the class and um, if this is truly yours, then you should be able to, to get through this. And he could, he could get up and he could, uh, with the emotion that he attached to the poetry, he could get through it fluently. And so these two individuals used um, strategies um, that helped them become more effective communicators and they still stutter to this day, but you probably wouldn't know it. Um, they know what words to avoid. Um, to my knowledge, they didn't see a speech pathologist, but um, the people that were in their lives um, definitely used things that speech pathologists would use today. Um, and then two other people, Gabby Giffords and Randy Travis, both experienced forms of traumatic brain injury, um, which affected the left hemis hemispheres of their brains or the language centers, resulting in pretty significant aphasia. Um, Gabby Giffords was shot in the head on January 8th of 2011 in Tucson, and Randy Travis in 2013 had viral cardiomyopathy, which led to a coma and a massive stroke that wasn't identified until three days later. So both of these experienced pretty significant trauma to their language centers, and both also used music to, um, to adapt and to become much better communicators. Um, you all need to get online and look at the videos of these people. Um, it's pretty heartwarming to see that, you know, Randy Travis could hardly talk, but he could sing Amazing Grace. And, and Gabby Giffords is giving, you know, once, once this um, very articulate congresswoman, um, you know, can now give um, small speeches for sure. Um, so I challenge you to look those up when you have some time. So and as we come to a close, um, I want to share a beautiful summary of um, the work of a speech pathologist that was sent to me by Joanna Smith. So Joanna, thank you for this. Uh, and it goes like this. 
sit back for a moment and let me tell you what a speech language pathologist pours their heart into day after day. We help a person whose brain can no longer send the correct signals to produce basic sentences, answer the simplest of questions so he can participate in social activities with others. We teach memory strategies to someone with dementia so she can remember the names of her grandchildren. We help a child on the autism spectrum with their social skills in the hopes that the bullying will stop and they will make one friend before the end of the school year. We rehab someone's swallowing muscles so they can have a sip of McAllister's iced tea because it's their absolute favorite. We give hope to the parents who have finally accepted their child as delayed after the doctor repeatedly tells them he's just a late talker. We teach someone with a new cochlear implant how to communicate without sign language after a lifetime of deafness when all they know. We ease a stuttering child's anxiety when they're preparing to stand up in front of their class to give a book report. We show, we show someone how to apply a passing mirror valve to their tracheostomy so they can use their voice to tell their family I love you. We have the difficult conversation with the family to tell them that grandma's cognitive impairments make her unsafe to go back to her home alone. We help a child pronounce certain sounds correctly after years of others reinforcing the wrong way when they reach an age where their impairment is no longer considered cute. We help a young intelligent woman who has had a massive stroke learn to use a speech generating device so that she can return to her vibrant and capable self. We think about these people when we're falling asleep at night. We pray for them. We spend time off the clock and our own money on things that we think may help them even the slightest. And we constantly put up with being misunderstood and overlooked. So if you know a speech therapist, tell them thank you and give them a hug. Because I promise you, after spending their days pouring their hearts into others, they need someone to replenish theirs. And I thought that was great. So it looks like we have a question. And the question is from Jessica Mugg. Is this why children with hearing loss often speak, or I'm sorry, often sing before they speak? That is a really good question, and the short answer of it is, my friend, is I don't know. I know that children love to sing, and it's something that um, children even with hearing loss um, are exposed to typically in preschool programs, and they just uh, they just love it. And I know we use that as a strategy in therapy um, to kind of teach them how to put words together um, in, in more of a conversational manner, and it's repetitive. So we could argue that, that yep, that could be true because song um, lyrics and songs typically are very repetitive. So it's a fantastic strategy. I don't know. I'd, I'm not sure off the top of my head if there's research to prove that. <laughs> but anecdotally, it seems to um, have some merit to it. Um, I, if there's any other questions, I'm happy to take them. And if there are any additional questions or comments that you have, I would direct your attention to asha.org, whatslp.com, heartsforhearing.org. If you have a question for me specifically, uh, you can email me at natalie.david at heartsforhearing.org. Um, we have another one coming through. Okay. What are some strategies parents can use to promote a language-rich environment at home? And this is such a good question. Um, it's not rocket science. Um, really, it's just about bathing a child's brain in language, making everything you do and say conversational in nature. Um, we, don't, we want to avoid using one word at a time. We want to use rich phrases rich sentences with lots of um, vocabulary whether or not we think it's too hard for them let's raise this bar for these kids no matter where they are in their journey exposing them to new vocabulary um, it's really and you can use books to do this as well um, books oftentimes will um, give you a word that you wouldn't think of to use um, with your child and so um, by building in literacy at home it can give you a great idea of, of just how to raise that bar with vocabulary. Um, that's a great question. Okay. 
Well, I hope you learned a little something you didn't know today regarding speech pathology. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us to recognize National Speech Pathologist Day. Give your favorite SLP a big hug. And apologies for the technical difficulties. And y'all have a great week. Bye.